could put up the prayers. We'll go ahead and get started with uh, those today. Okay, so we have the praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. Again, we do this once. And as we do this, we can recall the qualities of the Buddha that are embodied in these uh, titles that we have for the Buddha, all these various accomplishments. But recall that this is not beyond our own reach. We all can attain the same realizations of the Buddha, the same levels of development, the same purification. We just have to uh, dedicate ourselves to this path. So we're aligning ourselves with that intention as we're praising the Buddha through these lines. To the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. So we continue with additional verses of praise to the three jewels. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects with supreme faith, I pay homage. And then we recollect the basic teachings of the Buddha. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions. Perform only perfect virtuous actions. Subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a visual aberration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud. See conditioned things as such. Through these merits, may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the foe of faults, and be delivered from samsara's ocean, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. And let's do a short mandala offering, uh, making this vast pure offering to all the holy beings, uh, our own gurus, and so on, so that we can receive their blessings and accomplish the path. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryata Yami. Then we take refuge and generate bodhicitta with this verse. Uh, the first two lines are renewing that sense of safe direction that we find in these teachings in particular, the Dharma, but also the Buddha who uh, through his compassion and wisdom gave us these teachings as well as the Sangha, the Supreme Assembly that have developed realizations beyond our own that we can rely upon as well. And then in the last two lines, uh, renewing that motivation of bodhicitta, thinking that we're here together today in this virtual space so that we can accomplish enlightenment, uh, so that we can lead all beings to attaining that exact same state. So let's uh, recite this once in English and then twice in the Tibetan with those thoughts. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Sangye chodang soki choknam la jangchu bardu dakni kyabsu chi daki chanyan gi pe sanam gi dola penchir sangye drupar shog sangye chodang soki choknam la jangchu bardu dakni kyabsu chi Daki chanyan gi pe sanam gi dola penchir sangye drupar shog. Okay, thank you, Mary. So let's go ahead and do a short meditation before we begin today's class. Give ourselves a chance to focus the mind a bit and to then generate a good motivation, refresh that motivation of bodhicitta that we just uh, recited the verse for. 
So just take a few minutes to focus the mind using the breath. And we'll do this in silence. If you need a suggestion on how to work with the breath, again, I generally encourage focusing in on this area around the nostrils where we feel the sensation of the air coming in and out. Uh, but again, if uh, you have another way that you work with the breath, you're welcome to do that for the next few minutes. And in any of our meditations, we wanna have that aspect we call introspection, that factor in our minds that's sort of checking in to see what the quality of our meditation is. And if we check in and we see that we've lost the breath, that we're wandering away elsewhere, uh, with whatever preoccupations or thoughts we might have, then at that time we let that go and return to the breath. But there's no judgment involved. We're just simply training our minds to be present. So I will ring the bell to begin the meditation period. We'll do a few minutes in silence, and then I'll lead you in a short reflection.
So now let's set our motivation for today and do this by recalling the topic that we're examining currently in this course, how we cultivate patience as the antidote to our anger. You know, it's said that anger is one of the greatest obstacles to this mind of bodhicitta that we're cultivating in this meditation. And if we think about it, we see that this is quite uh, important to address. Bodhicitta is a mind that embraces the welfare of each and every single sentient being. And as long as we are holding hatred, animosity, anger in our hearts towards even just one sentient being, we will be blocked from developing that mind fully. So you might take a moment to even reflect on those beings who you might be still harboring some anger towards. And think about the fact that you need to address that and to open your heart to those beings through some of the things that we discussed last Sunday. Seeing that those beings are under the control of their own delusions. seeing that these beings have a fundamentally pure nature. It's only adventitious uh, stains that are causing them to do this. It's only because they haven't addressed the causes of anger. That anger arises in their mind and thereby they harm us, they harm others. They harm others out of many different delusions. But all those delusions are not in the nature of that being. That being has Buddha nature, has the ability to develop their minds completely in the same way that we possess that Buddha nature. So again, think about those beings that you do have some level of anger or resentment towards and try to hold them in this light of understanding their situation very clearly. And moreover, understanding how we need those difficult people in our lives. If we are ever to develop our patience, our compassion, our love to the greatest degree, we need those who challenge us. They are actually giving us a great gift. And then open your heart to not just these beings who are more challenging, where we do find it difficult to hold them in that space of the mind of bodhicitta, but to all beings to all the other difficult beings in our lives, all of those who are strangers, and especially, of course, all those who are already friends and very close to us. But every single one of these beings is the object of this mind of bodhicitta, a mind that desires to benefit them to the greatest degree, but also a mind that recognizes that we can't do this yet in our current state. We have to transcend our limitations. We have to develop these perfections. We have to take our mind to the state of complete enlightenment where we will have purified everything that obscures our minds and fully developed everything that is positive and beneficial for both ourselves and others. And then upon attaining that state, we will be in the perfect position to benefit those beings. So hold that mind of bodhicitta very firmly in your heart so it becomes the cause for the enlightenment of yourself and all beings and inspires you throughout this class as well as this day, this week, this month, this year, this life and beyond to strive towards that goal. Okay, wonderful again. Good to see you all today. Welcome. So we are working with this class that again, I started at the beginning of this year, uh, where we're looking at each of the six perfections. We're up to the third perfection, the perfection of patience. Uh, previously, we went through generosity, and then ethics or morality. And so patience is, again, they will recall that all of these six are set out in terms of being more and more difficult to practice. And so obviously, it is hard to have a mind that is completely patient. 
the mind of patience being this undisturbed mind, a mind that is not going to uh, react with any form of upset, anger, whatever, at what we have to experience uh, or what we see others experiencing. Of course, if we are motivated by compassion to address what is going on in our world, this is a very different mindset, as I've discussed previously. But whenever we have this delusion present, we are looking at the negative qualities of something and we're exaggerating those, accentuating those, and only clinging to that as our view of things. And on the basis of that, developing a mind that has this aversion, everything from a minor irritation all the way up to full-fledged rage towards what is going on uh, to us. Uh, or even to others in cases. So if we're going to be effective in the world, if we're going to actually act out of compassion and loving kindness, then we need to address our anger. As I said in the meditation, this is one of the biggest obstacles to developing bodhicitta. So in the last class, we did talk about the most important, perhaps, of, of these three types of patients. So again, they're all important. But this one is the one where we have patience when others are harming us. This is where we do block our hearts to many, many people because they are either holding views that are opposed to ours or they are, you know, uh, doing things that harm us or those that we love. Uh, they're doing things that, again, we can disapprove of. And there's nothing wrong with disapproving of those actions. But we have to separate the actions from the being. And this is what we looked at a lot last week in terms of uh, understanding that the reason why beings act in ways that are harmful to us or others are because they're under the control of their own delusions. Uh, so this is, again, an understanding that we can have. And as I said in the meditation, recognizing that every being has Buddha nature. They're just obscured at this moment to being able to be in touch with that. They are dealing with stains that can be removed, just as we are working on removing our own anger and diminishing its power in our minds. They can do the same thing. It's just that for many of them, they don't have that knowledge or ability to do that. So we can feel, you know, uh, unbelievable joy at our having found the Dharma that helps us to do that, but we can recognize that others don't have that good fortune, perhaps. And I pointed out in previous teachings uh, many times that I really appreciated when I was young, growing up in the Roman Catholic tradition, a lot of the teachings of Christ. I think he said a lot of really wise things, but I don't feel that in that tradition, at least I wasn't privy to it. I, was, I wasn't receiving teachings that taught me how to do these things. Like when Christ said, you know, if somebody slaps you on your right cheek, then turn, turn your left, you know, give them your left cheek to slap as well. Or when Christ said, love your enemies, you know, these are very profound teachings, but we need to know how to do this. And this is what this course is really to help us to do with each of these perfections, is to hopefully gain some uh, instruction on what we can meditate on, how we can bring those meditations to life in our everyday uh, actions and interactions with others. So this is uh, why we're going through this, and hopefully it's of some benefit. So again, in the last class, you went through this whole list. Let me go ahead and put it on the screen. Oh, I do need to have the screen share, Mary. I'm sorry. Um, there was the handout that, again, most of you have probably downloaded. It's called Mind of Patience. Mind of Patience is a, kind of a little summary that I put together for what we are going through here. Um, and so the very first part, uh, again, was this first type of patience, the patience of remaining indifferent to the harm inflicted by others. You know, to restrain from retaliating or to have even a mind of resentment towards those who harm us um, and to replace it with compassion, with uh, loving thoughts rather than harmful thoughts. So there are a number of reasons there. What is it, about uh, seven, eight reasons, something like that. Um, so you can go through this and pick ones that you want to work with and the ones that you feel more inclined that make more sense to you. But, you know, again, try to find something that you can use in your meditation with a particular situation that you have going on, or perhaps there's somebody who you've had some strong resentment towards from the past, uh, to try to heal that, to try to work with that. And again, these are not just reasons that are like good ideas. It's not like the Buddha said, oh, this is a, a nice way to think. These are also in line with truth, in line with the Buddha's teachings. You know, what I was saying earlier about understanding that that being who is harming us is under the control of their own delusions. Well, this is true. This isn't, a, you know, just something we're making up as a way of, you know, this is pacifying our own minds. You know, there's a lot of things you can do that are fiction that you can make up to not get angry at others. But these are truth. These are grounded in the Buddha's teachings. So... So again, try to work with those as best as you can. And today we'll go through the other two types of patients and perhaps even beyond that to some of the other topics. But um, the idea is, is that these are tools for us to use. 
And if we don't actually spend the time in examining them, analyzing them, and then bringing them to life when we're off the cushion, uh, then you know that's the whole point of all of this. If we you know can't do that work or aren't able to do that work, um, that's one thing. But nonetheless, you know it's uh, important that we take this sort of seriously. This is a you know something that we really all feel inclined towards is to develop our minds and our hearts in this direction. So we do have to do the work. One thing I want to touch on before we leave this topic of uh, others who harm us and maintaining patience with them is the idea too of forgiveness. You know, we don't talk about forgiveness so much in Buddhism, but it really is sort of an auxiliary to this topic of patience. Because if we are able to let go of our own uh, kind of anger, upset at what others are doing to us, it's nice to consider going to the degree of actually forgiving others for their faults. Again, the Buddhist teachings on forgiveness are rooted in this whole concept that others aren't necessarily choosing what they're going to do at any moment. We're not going to completely get rid of any concept of like a free will, though this isn't a term we use in Buddhism. Beings do have the opportunity to do something different in the moment. That's the whole point of the Buddha's teachings. That's why we're trying to work on our own minds so we can do something different rather than our habitual patterns of anger. But the beings who are we're confronting often, you know, don't have that knowledge or that ability, right? Or, uh, you know, at that time, they can develop it certainly. But you know, this understanding also feeds into our ability to forgive them because we understand that their works in progress and have not yet, you know, developed an awareness that will allow them to do something different. It doesn't mean, again, we are in any way condoning the actions of others when we forgive them. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we can once more isolate the action from the person. We can forgive the person because the person is once more under the control of all these various factors and doing things on the basis of that. And we can disapprove of their actions and highlight the importance for them to begin to address their actions. But nonetheless, the person themselves is an object of compassion, an object of love and therefore an object of forgiveness. So Ken, I would encourage you to, you know, if you do have some old wounds that you've had in your life or even fresh ones that you have from interactions with others and you haven't yet gotten to a place where you've forgiven others for that, that you work on that. And know that I have taught on this a number of times before. There's a wonderful meditation on forgiveness that Jack Kornfield has out at his website where you go first into forgiving yourself for the things you've done, then seeking forgiveness from others so that you get kind of your own experience with that first, and then go to the level of forgiving others. Whether or not they apologize, it's important that we have a pattern of forgiving them. And there may be beings that we can't actually go to and forgive. Maybe they've gone out of our lives, perhaps they've died, perhaps they're just beings that harmed us at one point and we don't know where they are in this world. But we can let go of that even in our own meditation through forgiving them in a process that is entirely in our own minds, but is a form of healing for ourselves and hopefully heals up some of that karma that we have with that person. So uh, I just thought I would uh, mention forgiveness because it's not something, again, that we uh, have uh, a lot of attention to in Tibetan Buddhism. It was one of the eight pillars when I've taught on the eight pillars of joy uh, previously, His Holiness and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu teaching on that subject. And even Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his daughter Mpo, they have put together a, a book on forgiveness that is really quite nice to read and their own approach to it from a Christian tradition, but also has a lot of uh, Buddhist similarities. So. So anyway, that's maybe enough on that. I can open it up at this point. I know I generally try to do questions at the end, but since we are going to move on to other topics, were there any final questions from yes, last week's class to, on this topic of uh, diminishing anger towards those who harm us? Anyone have anything they'd like to say? You can unmute your mic or you can put something in the chat box, certainly. Is there anything in the chat box? <laughs> Hi, Don. I have a question. This is Leah. Oh, hi, Leah. Hi. Hey, uh, last week you were talking about, so sometimes we might have the karma to have a mind that is easily ups injured. Mm -hmm. And how does that pertain to what you're talking about right now regarding someone who we feel may have injured us or done something to harm mm -hmm. us? and developing the forgiveness. Um, how do we work with it from the other 
angle, like you mentioned last week, our karma. Yeah. Um, thanks for your question, Leah. So again, when we have the understanding of our own karma, we can we can acknowledge that we are playing a part in it. You know, we take some responsibility for the fact that we've created that sort of energy that has then attracted their harming us. And so we can have that understanding. Uh, again, in regard to applying that to forgiveness, we would say that that you have the ability then to acknowledge that just as you have fallen prey to your own faults in the past that has up kind of created that type of karmic uh, target, if you will, that others are then, you know, harming you on the basis of, that then we have an understanding that they are in the same predicament, uh, continuing to harm others through the force of their own delusions. And unfortunately, through their actions, they're going to be creating the potential to be harmed by others on the basis of what they're doing to us or to other beings. So there's a lot of room in there for us to work. And in fact, you know, I don't know, I mean, maybe we get back to your question in a moment, but there is this idea that perhaps we are kind of severing the karmic links that we have with that person that are unhealthy through forgiving and through not having a mind of anger. If karma is that personal, which we've talked about before, I think we even got into it last week, you know, that karma is very personal, uh, according to what Rinpoche says, and it makes some sense that when we're harmed by a particular being, we've harmed them in the past. So there is this karmic target again that we've set up on the basis of holding on to in the past that anger and resentment towards them that has then made us susceptible to receiving harm from them. So if we actually sever that, if we don't perpetuate that through our understanding that we will simply have to go through that again, you know, we're setting up the, the target once more because we're going to resent that person, hold on to that, that anger, and they will come back around, we'll, we'll, they'll come back into our lives, we will harm them, then they will harm us, and we will harm them, and they will harm us, and, you know, it becomes this uh, unending uh, th tragedy, really. So, again, I haven't really heard too many Tibetan teachers talk about this, but it does seem that one of the advantages of being able to have this understanding and to not have anger towards someone else, because we recognize that we are creating that from our side, that we are part of the the problem, <laughs> take responsibility for that, is that we aren't going to experience that cycle again. We're going to let it go by severing that and not uh, cause harm to them in the future and not be harmed by them in the future because we don't keep perpetuating that cycle. So we can see the advantages for both ourselves and others then in regard to our forgiving karmically because it doesn't allow then them to experience any more harm from us in the future and we will not experience harm from them in the future if we make the decision kind of be the adult in the room you know and decide we're going to take the high road and not uh, engage in this pattern of tit for tat and continuing to go through this cycle of never really breaking free from any entanglements we have with other beings so there is that wisdom of karma that can be applied to this as well that gives us an underpinning for understanding why it is good for everyone in involved to do that. Now, again, whether or not we actually go to the person and forgive them, it's not just that maybe sometimes beings won't be in your life anymore, but there also may be beings who are really quite harmful and will perpetuate that harm if we, you know, try to go to them again, maybe try to restore the relationship or what have you. There's nothing wrong with, you know, deciding that we can't do that, that the, the, based on their delusion and what's going on with them, that maybe it's best for us not to be having them directly in our lives. But we don't, you know, kick them out of our heart. We still hold on to them as a being that we really care about, that we wish well for, that we have compassionate thoughts towards, and that we have forgiven in our own minds, whether or not we have the opportunity to do that in person. So the karmic, I don't know if that answered your question. Did that get at some of it, Leah? Okay. Because I think it is an important understanding that we have to have behind this. It was interesting when I, I think I mentioned this previously as well, but uh, the, the topic of forgiveness, I'd never really taught on it before. And I was asked to do a little panel here in Santa Fe on uh, 
uh, Reverend Phil's show. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Reverend Phil. He had a cable show for a while and uh, interesting uh, person who kind of, he has a, an organization called Church of the One God, where he feels like he sort of takes the bits and pieces from various spiritual traditions and really embraces them as valuable lessons for himself and how to live his life. He's really quite an amazing guy. But anyway, he had this little panel of people it sounds like a setup for a joke. It was a Jewish rabbi, uh, me, a Buddhist teacher, um, unity minister, and a retired um, Episcopalian priest, I think. You know, all walk into a bar. <laughs> they all walk into a panel on forgiveness. And it was interesting to see the different perspectives. You know, when you start, of course, we were the only, I was the only one there representing a non-theistic tradition. So in the other traditions, you also are seeking forgiveness from God, from your creator. Whereas in Buddhism, we are our creators, you know, so we are the ones that have to work on forgiving ourselves and forgiving others and so on. But it was really quite interesting, the differing perspectives. And the very first thing that I talked about, as I recall, was really rooting all of this in, in karma and an understanding of karma. You know, why would we hold somebody that accountable and put the blame entirely on them when we are a part of the equation? We are part of what created that. Again, it's not letting them off the hook. Everybody thinks, well, then, you know, you're just condoning the actions that they're doing. You're not. The actions that they're doing are faulty. They're wrong. The actions that we would be doing on the basis of our anger are faulty and wrong. There's just an objective assessment of those not being healthy and wholesome for ourselves or others in the world. But, you know, we can understand the setup. Why are we in that predicament? Why is that person harming us? I mean, recall the teachings that I shared from Rinpoche uh, a number of times where in 2016, before the election, when essentially Rinpoche was saying that America was going to get the president that America had the karma for, had the merit for, that that is, you know, what we've been dealing with these four years and are continuing to deal with until if, you know, he actually leaves the White House. I mean, this is a karmic creation. Even at that national level or even global level, things are created karmically. It is the creation of our experiences through our own minds. So we take responsibility for that side of it. And of course, we recognize that having minds of forgiveness, patience, tolerance, kindness, compassion, love are going to create a much better karma than the minds that got us into the predicament in the first place. The minds of greed and uh, self-centeredness and pride and all of the various things, anger, of course, that have led us into the predicament that we find ourselves in. So karma is definitely the underpinning for forgiveness, for understanding uh, why it's important to be patient and so on. And many other teachings feed into it, but it's really the essence of uh, all of these teachings. Uh, karma, of course, plays such a central role in uh, all three levels of the stages of the path. So, all right. So thank you, Leah, for that question. Anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask about others harming you and uh, mind of patience in the face of that. Okay. All right, I don't see anything in the um, chat box. So let's go ahead and go back to the slides then. Okay, let me get the this in a formal slideshow kind of format. Okay, so uh, again, uh, that I don't need to necessarily show for a long time. We will go on from here after we cover patients to the remaining, at least uh, the fourth one. We haven't decided exactly when we're going to do the fifth and the sixth, but uh, we'll be letting everyone know. Uh, we are on the perfection of patience, which once more, whoops, is a virtuous mind that can remain indifferent to any form of harm inflicted by others. That's the first type. Can voluntarily endure any form of suffering, which is what we're going to go into next, and remain definitely thinking about the Dharma. There's even a level of patience that's involved in our uh, moving our minds towards the Dharma, maintaining our awareness of that and so on. So we saw that there were those three different types that were mentioned in the definition. Let's go on to the second one. The second one, again, the definition of it is on your handout as well, the mind of patience. This is the capacity to happily take on any form of suffering or difficulty and turn it into the path to enlightenment. Now, what's the difference between this and the previous one? Well, certainly, you know, the, we are experiencing suffering when others are harming us. Here, the idea is, is that we are in a more general way looking at all the various things that constitute suffering experiences within existence. 
you know, the Buddha taught extensively on suffering, right? This is, was his very first teaching that he gave in the Four Noble Truths. The first truth of the four is the truth of dukkha, as it's called in Sanskrit, which is essentially translated as suffering. But we, in that context, we elaborate to include other experiences that we don't readily identify as suffering. For most of us, it's quite easy to see the sufferings that are uh, causing the mind of anger to arise. You know, the suffering of things not going your way, of having a computer that malfunctions, of having, um, you know, uh, noise in the neighborhood, of having, you know, all the various things that make us angry and upset, you know, that are not necessarily beings doing it, harming us. They're just something we have to deal with. It's the ra reality of our lives. But recall that this is actually the very first of the three levels of suffering or dukkha that the Buddha taught. The Buddha said that there is this more obvious manifest form that we can all readily identify. And that's only the tip of the iceberg though, because the Buddha went on to say that even in the second teaching where he talked about the suffering of change, the second aspect of this truth of dukkha, he essentially says that even our pleasant experiences change and therefore are really not satisfactory. So even the good things you have in your life, and you may be very grateful for those good things you have in your life and enjoy them, but recognize that they don't last. They are incapable of truly satisfying. You know, no matter what we have in our conditioned existence that we go to, especially the sense objects and so on, these things don't ultimately satisfy. And, and if we were to actually engage in them repeatedly, they would become pain, painful. They would become that first type of suffering. Um, Again, we learned this when we were uh, quite young. You know, I like to use cake. I know Venerable Rabina uses chocolate cake, but you can fill in whatever cake you like or whatever dessert you like. Um, pumpkin pies coming up on Thanksgiving. So <laughs> whatever you find delightful. But no doubt when you were quite young and you first went to maybe like a birthday party or something and they had all that cake, you know, you, you may have overindulged, right? You think, oh, this first piece tastes really good. I'm gonna have another one. And you have another one and then maybe even a third one. And by then your stomach's getting so full that it actually is painful. You know, so it didn't really give you greater pleasure the more cake that you ate. It actually led to suffering. Moreover, it didn't last. You know, that one initial experience of eating cake is something that is long gone. We've eaten many pieces of cake since then. You know, we keep going back to it. This is the nature of our samsaric uh, experiences of pleasure. We kind of keep going back to the table and getting what we want and thinking that it's maintaining our happiness, our peace, because we just keep getting to that place where we satisfy it. And we have learned how to do things in moderation. We're not little kids at a birthday party any longer, you know, stuffing our face with all kinds of stuff. You know, we, and well, maybe except for Thanksgiving. But anyway, the idea is, is that we um, have learned how to control all this. And we think that that's, that's, that's the solution, right? If I just, you know, have a little bit of something every day, you know, and do this to entertain my mind, listen to some music here, watch some television there, go out for a walk here, do all these various things, all these things that we find pleasure in, that somehow I'm going to have a good life. Well, the Buddha says this is an illusion. You know, we're not really finding any real satisfaction. Then the third level of dukkha that the Buddha taught is the fact that we are in a state that we could call unsatisfactory. Why? Because we're under the control of our karma and delusions. Because we are subject to having to experience things that we aren't planning for, aren't ready for, don't expect to happen. That's the nature of our karma, that things constantly changing and coming into our experience. And we have our delusions that are guiding us through a lot of that, that are the cause of why we create the karma to have those experiences. And until we address that factor, we're not going to be free of what we call suffering or dukkha. So again, this is, this is uh, mostly focusing on, in this particular presentation on patients, mostly focusing on the problems that we have that we easily identify as dukkha, which again, we would call the suffering of uh, pain or manifest suffering. But uh, again, recall that this is just the tip of the iceberg and we should be opening our minds to meditating on the uh, unsatisfactory nature of existence as part of this. We're gonna see that coming up in terms of one of the techniques that we use. So this is this idea that is very similar to mind training, to Lojong. And uh, some of the things I'm gonna talk about, I talked about two weeks ago when I was examining how to um, see our current events and through a Buddhist lens. So let's go on to first get a little commentary from Rinpoche on this from his book on the six perfections. The second of the three types of patients 
is the patience of voluntarily accepting suffering. When we reflect deeply on our life, we will see how while we remain in this unenlightened state, it is not only unavoidable to experience suffering, but also completely natural. You know, this is a part and parcel of our existence to have suffering, to have pain. You know, and of course, we have the other types of suffering of change, uh, the uh, conditioned suffering that is being under the control of our karma and delusions, all of that as well. But it's certainly natural for most of us to have the suffering of pain at times in our lives, to you know, have loneliness, to have uh, grief, to have all the various things that are part and parcel of a human experience. So Rinpoche goes on to say, we should see that the nature of whatever we experience with our unsubdued mind is only suffering, regardless of whether it is a pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling. This is what he's getting at that is the bigger definition of suffering. See that the nature of whatever we experience while we have an unsubdued mind, while we have not yet tamed our own minds and rid ourselves of all the delusions and so on, is only suffering. It's only dukkha regardless of whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling. I mean, essentially, karma is the force through which we create our feelings. You know, we talk about these three feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Those are all karmic ripenings. We talk about karma being the cause. Well, its result is to have these experiences where we, those feelings are triggered. And we see that, again, those are even karmically conditioned to some degree. Uh, you know, that there's nothing that is sort of inherently there that causes these feelings to arise. They are our own creation. So I was talking about music earlier, and I like to use music as an example because we all have different tastes in music. Um, you know, some of us might have overlapping things, that, things that we like, but then you might go to somebody else's, you know, CD collection or what they have on their, their phone, you know, the stuff that they play and listen to, and you might like some of it, and then some of it you go, oh my God, you like that, right? You know, so you, 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 we have this different view of music, and it's the same notes essentially that are playing for me or for anyone else. But for me, I might hear those notes and go, oh, this is really beautiful music. I love this music. I find it very pleasant. It induces a pleasant feeling. But then I can play those same notes for someone else and they go, oh, that music is awful. Get that off. You know, I don't even want to listen to it. Okay, so they've got an unpleasant feeling arising. So who's right? Well, no one's right per se. We're both just having a karmic imprint that causes us to hear a particular thing and have the feeling be pleasant or have the feeling be unpleasant. And then of course we have the one that we don't talk about so much, which is the neutral feelings. A lot of people will hear some music and they just aren't even registering one way or another. And it's just like, oh, that's kind of so-so. I mean, I don't really care much about it. Don't hate it, you know, don't like it you know, whatever. So music is just one example, but we have this with regard to everything that we experience, right? Some people can go to a, a movie and really enjoy it and have a wonderful time. Other people go, oh, that was the worst movie I've ever seen. Who's right? Well, again, it's all in the eye of the beholder, in the eye of the experiencer and karmically conditioned to be experienced such. So again, this is what we are engaging in is all these different feelings arising. And for us, those things that induce an unpleasant sensation, we call those the suffering of pain. That is what we are identifying and that is what we're having this strong reaction of anger to that we're trying to address here. But even those things that are pleasant that we have this karmic conditioning to experience is pleasant, as I said, that's the suffering of change. Doesn't ultimately satisfy, can change into pain even. And then of course, we just have the neutral feelings that are arising on the basis of just our everyday actions that aren't really infused with any positive or negative motivation. And that's kind of akin to the sort of uh, ignorance that is there, the, the dullness that is there that is representative of just our general state of being, this uh, pervasive condition suffering, this third type of suffering. So whatever feeling is arising, a neutral feeling, a pleasant feeling, an unpleasant feeling, it's all part of our unsatisfactory experience of samsara. Rinpoche is just reminding us that we should see it all as dukkha, you know, not just be highlighting those things that we can very readily and easily see as dukkha. Though in this context, again, that is what generally causes us to have anger. So we have to reframe what we are experiencing again. This is the whole point of the mind training teachings and of that definition of this second type of patience where we are uh, being able to endure whatever is going on and moreover transform it into a positive state. 
So these are the reasons uh, for this type of practice that are mentioned on the handout as well. Uh, this first one is uh, uh, just a general sort of statement on how we have to work with this. And this is uh, because suffering occurs continually, or at least periodically. It's not something that we have any complete end to yet. You know, every day of our life, we have something, no doubt, that occurs that causes some measure of suffering, of pain, of uh, anguish, what have you. And that which is produced by your former karma cannot be dispelled you know, it's ripened into that particular experience. It's not like you can do anything to address it at that point. We have to face that reality. You must know how to bring it into the path. You must know how to transform that experience of suffering that is a product of your past karma, that unpleasant feeling, that unpleasant situation, and make it into the path. And he says, otherwise, you either generate hostility or become discouraged and thus create interferences with applying yourself to virtue. So again, these are the teachings that are essentially involved in the, uh, the topic of mind training, where we are looking at everything that we're experiencing that we are calling suffering, adverse situations, uh, things that are causing us pain and difficulty, and actually seeing them as amazing opportunities to practice. So as I said, I talked about this a bit two weeks ago when we talked about everything going on in our world, the political unrest, uh, racial injustice, uh, climate change, uh, pandemic. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. And no doubt each of us has our own individual list of things in our life that are happening for us. Maybe even, you know, financial concerns, uh, relationship concerns, health concerns, what have you. I mean, we've got our own uh, laundry list of all the things that we would identify as suffering in our life right now. But we need a healthy relationship to those things. Those things are karmically created. We have already done the action in the past and it has already ripened into what we are having to experience. You know, we didn't get around to purifying that. And so guess what? We have to face that reality. So the advice here is you got to transform that into the path. We actually have to make this something beneficial. Kind of take that, you know, uh, 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 what we might normally call, pardon my French shit, and make it into manure that we can actually fertilize our garden with. <laughs> you know, this is one analogy for that, maybe not a, a very savory one, but nonetheless, something that you know gets at what we are doing here. We are transforming what is normally seen as negative into something that will actually help things to grow, to become much more positive. So this is the, the miracle of mind training, which, uh, again, makes a lot of sense, right? Because if we do the opposite, as was pointed out in that uh, identification of this first way of working with it, if we generate hostility, we get angry and upset at what's going on in our lives, or we become discouraged, depressed. I mean, a lot of people have that going on, right? You know, I mean, I was just hearing something earlier about all of the uh, mental health concerns for our frontline you know, healthcare workers, you know, they are every day, day in and day out, especially now when the pandemic is raging, dealing with unbelievable, you know, suffering in terms of what they are witnessing and them having to be there and support people through this and try to keep their own minds engaged and caring for others with such a uh, unbelievable toll going on. I mean, you know, it's very easy to become discouraged at the suffering of the world and the suffering we have to experience. So if we don't have a technique to work with that suffering, if we aren't able to actually transmute that suffering into something positive, then we're going to just fall into those patterns. And unfortunately, we're going to end up creating more interferences, more difficulties for ourselves. We're not going to actually advance our minds towards enlightenment. So this is the gift of all of these experiences of suffering, all those unpleasant situations and feelings that we have is to actually be able to transmute them in this way. Of course, it's not enough just to say we're going to do that. You know, we have to have techniques for doing that. So the first one to look at, uh, the next one to look at is uh, on the, the, the chart as well, is coming from this wonderful verse from Master Shantideva, the 10th verse of his sixth chapter on patience, where it's stated here, if you can remedy a situation in which suffering occurs, there's no need for dejection. If you cannot remedy it, dejection is useless. It's not something that produces any real major results. So this is one way of initially framing our minds in terms of looking at what it is that is causing us to have that suffering experience. 
Now, again, I wouldn't say that the Buddha is always a fan of us trying to change the external world to stop our suffering. But Master Shantideva nonetheless gives us that advice right from the beginning, because sometimes just that little tweak of something out external to us can make a difference. So if it is something that you can change, if it is something that you can do something about in your world, well, then by all means, feel free to do that. Do it with a mind that's very clear in terms of not you know, together with anger or resentment or anything else. In other words, yeah, don't go kill the person who harmed you, you know, thinking that's a good solution. Well, that gets rid of it. I can do something about it. I can take their life and then I won't have to deal with them anymore. That's not what we mean here. We mean here again that with a healthy, wholesome mind, if there's something you can change that will again, allow yourself to stop to exp stop experiencing that suffering, perhaps allow others to stop experiencing that suffering. Well, then you do that. You put your energy there. But the dejection, worry, fear, anxiety, anger, resentment, none of these make sense if you can actually change something. And of course, in the big picture, Buddhism is always about the fact that we can change everything to the greatest degree by working on our own minds and developing ourselves to Buddhahood. That's the ultimate change that we're all aiming for. But nonetheless, if there are more immediate temporal changes we can make, you know, go ahead, do those things. Do them with, again, as clear and uh, positive state of mind as you can muster up to do them. But the second part of that verse, and if it's something you cannot change, well, then there's really no use in having anger, dejection, worry, anxiety, stress, right? Because it's something you have to accept the reality of. I mean, again, with looking at what's going on in our world, there is a certain amount of that that we say we do have to accept the reality of. You know, the death counts are undeniable. You know, and it's something that we do have to be keeping our hearts open to and using it to change our minds rather than recognizing we can't do anything to change that in our physical world. We can change what might transpire afterwards through our own compassionate actions of you know, wearing a mask and social distancing and doing all the things that we can to avoid um, you know, creating a, a greater pandemic than would already exist. But nonetheless, the things that have already transpired are things of the past. We can't really do anything to change those at this point. We can only change our minds. But you know, this is, again, what do we do with that? That's still, you know, the questions that we're going to get into in terms of the next uh, point is that we actually have to take that information of what we are facing in our world that we can't change, but even sometimes those things that we can change and let them feed into what we want to practice, how we want to use the teachings of the Buddha to develop ourselves. So we are greater capable to uh, you know, be at peace ourselves through our, this mind of patience, but moreover, we're uh, in a greater position to help others, to benefit them. So let's go on to that one, and we might not have time to get through all of this last point that's on there, because it has about, what, uh, five different ways of working with uh, the suffering that we're experiencing. And this is to recall that suffering has these various good qualities, that actually the, the first one, and I'll, rec I'll recite some of the verses from Master Shantideva that pertain to this, the very first one of spurring us on to liberation, helping us to develop renunciation. This actually is uh, verse 12 of chapter 6. Uh, let me read that verse for you. It says here, the cause of happiness is rare, and many are the seeds of suffering. All right, this is a situation we find in, uh, find ourselves in. But, you know, nonetheless, it's not to say that we're bereft of happiness. We do have our temporal happiness, but if we look at it, actually, there's a lot of things that could be uh, causing us more suffering than happiness in our lives. Many are the seeds of suffering, you know, Shanti Deva says. But if I have no pain, he says, I'll never long for freedom. Therefore, oh my mind, be steadfast. You know, if we don't have an experience of pain and difficulty in our lives, we aren't going to strive for liberation. We aren't going to strive to be free of this. Of course, that was why, again, the Buddha in his teaching on the Four Noble Truths didn't stop just at saying, this is suffering, uh, dukkha, this is why we're in that situation through our karma and delusions, the second truth. He went on to say, there can be an end to all of this. You know, if, if there wasn't that additional message from the Buddha that there was a cessation of our suffering that could occur, and we can knack that ourselves through the path. Well, then it wouldn't make much sense, right? We'd be striving for a liberation that's unattainable. But the Buddha said it is attainable. It's something every one of us can practice. We just need to put our minds towards it. The very first step, though, is to turn away from the patterns that are uh, keeping us 
engaged in cyclic existence and turn towards liberation, towards freedom. Of course, this is the realization, as you know, that's on the middle scope of the Lam Rim. It's the uh, kind of the way that we take personal responsibility for our own having created uh, samsara, our own experience within this cycle of existence and wanting to break free from that. So we need to recognize all three levels of suffering to do that. I mean, it's not to say that just acknowledging the first type of suffering, which is what this patience is pointed towards, uh, is enough. You know, every being has some level of renouncing the suffering that is pain. You know, even animals, right? They don't want to experience pain. Mm. So this is, again, not to say that, that we stop there with acknowledging that those painful experiences are everything we need to med meditate on to develop true renunciation, but we see that as a touchstone to get us into this investigation to recognize that as cushy as life might get, because that is one thing that keeps us from developing renunciation is that we get sucked back into thinking samsara is not that bad. You know, this year, 2020, maybe we're not thinking that at all, but nonetheless, you know, in, generally in our lives, we do kind of have this ability to come under the control of that type of mindset and be seduced by how things are going relatively well for us in samsara. You know, this is something that, again, we have to address further down the road. But the very first point is to get the reality that we're all dealing with some level of pain. You know, in this human existence, uh, even the people who are the richest people who are the cushiest lives still have to experience the pain of aging, still have to experience illness. You know, a number of them, uh, celebrities and what have you throughout the pandemic have succumbed to that illness as well, and died from that illness. You know, so it's not to say that, again, uh, there's any sort of um, uh, guarantee that we'll go through our lives without that first level of suffering, but use what you have in your life of that first level of suffering to uh, be it an entryway into understanding renunciation. So again, the mind of renunciation or this mind that seeks liberation that was pointed out here is the mind that clearly sees all three of those levels of suffering, turns away initially from the pain that we see is entailed in life, uh, a lot of things that are unpleasant about life that we do want to turn away from. Secondly, looks at the fact that even those things that are causing us happiness, those pleasant feelings, aren't really ultimately satisfying. And then third, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep being under the control of our karma and delusions and having these unsatisfactory experiences if we don't do something different. So this is what's really entailed in the mind of renunciation is seeing all three levels of that. But again, the, this was being pointed out here because that tip of the iceberg is an important place to start. That is something where we can actually see that life isn't that good. There was that bumper sticker a lot of people had on their cars, right? Life is good. And you want to just put a little footnote on that and say, <laughs> it only appears good. You know, it doesn't really have kind of goodness in terms of an ability to ultimately satisfy. It is good to have this human life, as we talk about frequently in this tradition, to be able to use this life as a, a platform for one's spiritual development. But there's nothing sort of inherently good about this life. You know, this life is filled with lots of suffering. It's all dukkha when it comes down to that deeper definition and understanding of dukkha, 24 7 dukkha, you know, something we really can't uh, call good or satisfactory because this is the whole point of the mind of renunciation is to see it for what it is and then to turn away from that and towards liberation. So that's the first of these uh, sort of techniques. And again, I may not spend as much time on some of the others since I did just talk about some of these two weeks ago, but it's 11 o'clock now, uh, just changed on my computer. Let's take 10 minutes and do a little stretch break. And when I come back, I'll continue with uh, the remainder of this point, And then we'll see if there are any questions on the second type of patients. Okay, good. Have a nice little break. See you in 10. It's been obviously, again, in our times that we're living in right now, a real challenge for us to keep our hearts open in the midst of so much pain, so much difficulty, so much suffering, anxiety, stress, what have you. But this is one of the things, again, to use our own suffering as a touchstone to become aware of the suffering of others and not just to have the awareness of it. But again, that's the first step. We have to open our minds to seeing that others are suffering. But then we have to open our hearts with more compassion for them, recognizing that just as we don't want to suffer, those beings don't want to suffer either. 
and then we can, if we develop that courage and conviction, I talked about this a bit uh, two weeks ago, we can even generate the mind that wishes to take away their suffering. This is the mind of great compassion. That is the bodhisattva's mentality. It's not just enough to say, oh, they're suffering out there. I wish it wasn't there. I, how wonderful it would be if these beings weren't suffering and may they not suffer. It's that extra step that we add on where we say, and I myself will do this for them. And Tong Lin is a wonderful way to enact that great compassion and the great love that wants them to be happy and have all the causes of happiness. So again, Tong Lin, many techniques uh, taught around how to practice Tong Lin. Uh, Tong means to give, Lin means to take, but we usually take away suffering first and then give our happiness second. Um, and this is something you can do whenever you're experiencing any type of pain or difficulty or even any happiness in your life. We talked about that as well, you know. Um, so this is a, a technique whereby whatever comes into your field of experience, be it something unpleasant or pleasant, and I guess you could do it with neutral as well, but those are the two poles that we vacillate between, and we generally have anger at the unpleasant and attachment towards the pleasant. Um, when those things arise, when we see something unpleasant, we start to open our hearts to the reality that others are experiencing something similar to that or perhaps even greater suffering than that, or if we can open our hearts to this vast suffering that is going on in the world all the time at those three levels, suffering of pain, suffering of change, pervasive conditions, suffering. If we can open our minds at that, our hearts at that time to all of that suffering, then our suffering becomes very useful. It's a means by which we can advance our great compassion. And in this meditation, you visualize taking away the suffering of others placing it on your own self-centeredness that is your reason why you think your suffering is so much greater than others or so much more important than others to be dealt with. So this is the idea behind that is to be able to take away suffering at that time from others or at least, at least to hold the thought through my having to endure my suffering, may others not have to suffer. And that's already a powerful form of Tonglen. It's not going to the degree of kind of taking that all on willingly, you know, taking in that suffering so that we experience it and they don't have to. But here the idea is, is at least have the thought that through my having to endure this headache or illness or whatever it is that's going on, may others not have to deal with that. May they be free of their suffering. And then we can advance the mind to eventually wish to take that away. And then we have the great love that's the companion to it, the giving away all that we have that brings us happiness so that others can have happiness, which is based on the recognition that they want to be happy just like we do. There's no difference, fundamental difference between ourselves and others. We all want to be free from suffering. We all want to be happy. And when you have a pleasant thing that goes on in your life, you can do the same. You know, today we're mostly talking about diminishing our anger at the suffering we experience, the pain we experience. But even with those happy experiences, give that away to others. Why make it all about you and your experience of the bliss of whatever, eating that, you know, ice cream or, you know, having a beautiful walk in the woods or whatever the case might be, watching a beautiful sunset. Anything that we have that brings us pleasure, share it send it out so that others can know that pleasure and know all the way up to the pleasure of complete enlightenment. Again, don't just stop at temporal pleasures or you know, temporal relief from suffering. Make it as big as you can. So this is the idea behind this, um, this technique. Uh, these things that we've looked at, we looked at five now. You know, again, the idea that we want to use it to influence our, when we have an experience of pain, difficulty, suffering, use it to increase our wish to be liberated, use it to diminish our arrogance, our pride, use it as a means to affect our karma by stopping to engaging in the negative karma that got us in that predicament and engage in the more virtuous karma that will give us a much more pleasant and better experience. And then fifthly, the Mahayanam technique of really opening up to the suffering of others. You know, and this is how we keep our experiences of suffering uh, channeling into the path, channeling into the realizations that we want. Now, I know everybody will look at that list and they'll think, oh, well, I'm just going to head right for number five. Number five sounds great. I can be this compassionate being and take on all the suffering of the world and give them all my happiness. You know, even I think I mentioned this two weeks ago when the pandemic started. I mean, I, I had that mentality and thinking, oh, this is the perfect opportunity to practice Tonglen. And it is, but recognize that you, you need the other foundational you know 
ways of working with suffering as a platform before going to that level. And so you might find it really hard to keep your heart open to all the suffering in our world right now. So use it wherever you can, but recognize that these are set out as part of the graded stages of the path. And it's best to work with channeling your experience of suffering into some of the lower realizations before you jump all the way up to this wonderful Mahayana motivation. But try to do all of that within the scope of wanting to work at that level. That's what bodhicitta is really about. It's our wish to be at that level, our desire to be dedicated to the welfare of all other beings and recognize that maybe we aren't there yet because we all have a lot of work to do. At least I have a lot of work to do. But recognize that this is how we get there is by actually working with these uh, experiences of suffering in very basic ways to remind you of karma, to remind you of diminishing your own pride, to remind you that you need to seek your own liberation before you can actually want others to be liberated. And then finally to get to the place where you can open your heart with compassion and practice Tonglen and wish to remove all the suffering of the world and give them all of your happiness. So. So just keep in mind that these are some of the techniques. Again, most of what we looked at uh, prior to this was just setting the stage for how we need to work with things, why we need to work with suffering. Because once more, it's going to be there. Hate to say it, as long as you're in samsara, you're going to be experiencing you know, the suffering of uh, being under the control of karma and delusions, but also, of course, suffering of change and quite frequently, you know, maybe not as frequently for us as for others, the suffering of pain, the suffering of these uh, difficult experiences. So rather than the mind getting angry and upset at what we have to deal with, channel it into developing realizations that will help you to develop your own potential and eventually help others to do the same. So, all right, let's open it up to see if there are any questions, because that's really the last point on this in regard to, yeah, Doris, I see your hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, I kind of balked at the word pity when you read that. Yeah. Um, and then you said that you don't like the word. Uh -huh. um, I find there's something contemptuous about pity. Is that what mm. you find? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, thanks for bringing that up, Doris. I kind of skirted over that and went on to something else. Forgot that I'd mentioned that. Yeah. Um, pity is actually when they sometimes talk about compassion um, in uh, the teachings, they talk about the far enemies of these positive states of mind, which for compassion would be like cruelty. Obviously, cruelty is the mind where there's <laughs> no compassionate seeds at all. And then they talk about the near enemies of these positive states of mind. The near enemies of compassion, one of them is actually pity. And, and pity does have that condescending note to it. It's, it's a bit of a feeling of superiority, at least the way we're using it in this context. Maybe some people wouldn't define it that way necessarily. But pity to me has that feeling of, oh, I'm up here looking down at poor you, you know, poor you, you're suffering, you know, mm. I'm not suffering, but you're suffering. You know, there's that, that, that kind of attitude towards it. Some people, you know, give money to homeless people out of pity because they look at them and they say them as just kind of unfortunate beings and they can throw something at them and kind of be rid of them in a way, you know, and they don't really have that connection with them as a, a real opening of the heart to that person suffering and what they're going through and a recognition that they're just like me, which is what compassion is going to hold. It's going to be much more uh, empathetic, whereas pity doesn't have as much empathy involved. It's recognizing the suffering. That's a wonderful thing about it, but it's not doing it in a way that is healthy. Um, the other one, just so you know, the other near mm -hmm. enemy of compassion I find really interesting. Um, uh, Pema Chodron says that the literal translation of the term uh, is horrified anxiety, but it's a sense of overwhelm that we often have when we open our hearts to the suffering of the world, right? Uh -huh. You know, where we just kind of go, oh my gosh, this is too much. I can't take this in. I mean, that was happening for me a lot. I think we. this is what happens in, with things like this in our world is that our hearts kind of close up over time or we become sort of null, uh, what's the word for it? numb, kind of mm. numb to what's going on. But, you know, when we initially open our hearts to something, it can be really overwhelming. Like this was happening, I think, for a lot of us at the beginning of the pandemic. And of course, our frontline healthcare workers, like I said, they're still dealing with the reality of what's going on. And it's just been month after month after month after month. It can be really overwhelming to keep your heart open in the midst of so much suffering. Again, it's got a good quality to it because it's, it's empathy. It's identifying with what's going on with others. 
but it's becoming kind of a burden. It's becoming mm -hmm. something that t takes over and makes us in inactive and in incapable of dealing with the suffering of the world. So it's got some good qualities to it, but it's missing the mark. That's why these are called near enemies, because if we fall into that pattern of overwhelm, then we can't really be so effective with our compassion. The antidote to that one, they say in particular, is to uh, recall that it's not a hopeless situation. I mean, that's why, again, the Buddha said in his first two truths, guess what, folks, you're all suffering and you're causing it through what's in your own mind. But then he went on in the last two truths to say, and you can end it. You know, hallelujah, good news. The Buddha's good news. It can be ended once and for all by practicing the path. So you recognize that this isn't a permanent state, that this isn't something that's never going to, going to change, that actually by practicing what you can to make yourself more capable, you'll be able to help others to a greater ability. I mean, all these sorts of thoughts that help us feel more energized at that time and not so burdened by opening our hearts to the suffering of the world. The antidote to pity is mm -hmm. equanimity, is to see that I'm in the same boat as, as that person who is homeless. I mean, that's where, again, some of you I know have gone to the, the shelter to help with meals and things like that. You know, sometimes people just want to be talked to as if you're a person just like everybody else. You know, they don't want pity. Who, what, who among us would want pity? You know, want somebody to kind of look down on us with that feeling of superiority and thinking we're just such poor wretches or something. You know, we want p people to identify with us, to see that. You know, in the Christian tradition, they have that idea of there, but for the grace of God, go I. In Buddhism, it's kind of there, but for the grace of my good karma, go I. But I, I've been there. Every one of us has been homeless, you know, has dealt with everything that is possibly uh, an experience in samsara that is unfavorable. And we've all done it through our countless lifetimes. We're all in the same boat. So if we have that more equanimous mind that sees that there's really no difference between myself and others, and then we can have an equal regard for those beings that we're meeting and open our hearts with compassion for them in the same way that we've already become, begun to be compassionate towards ourselves. So that's the whole point of pity not really being the right term. I, I don't know why people still use that in translations because this is not this is not an old translation. It's a relatively new one. And um, yeah, the one I've been reading from for these verses from Shantideva is the Padmakara group uh, translations uh, that Shambhala Publications published. I like them in general because they're much more poetic than some of the other ones that are a bit more literal, but there are times when their word usage is a little strange. So thank you for bringing that up, Doris. Anything? Oh, thank you. That that was great. <laughs> thank oh, <okay>. you. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, I'm glad I could satisfy you with yes. that answer. Anyone else have any questions or was there anything in the chat box, Mary? I didn't get a look yet, but oh, there's something no, from there Marina. Are... Wait, are there? I'm sorry. Oh, this came to me personally. That's why. I guess you are okay with me reading this, Rowena, but sometimes there is a serious sense of shock when you are first hit by pain. I would like to find a preliminary level. All you are saying is applicable and very true, but at the at first, it is difficult to move suggestions. Okay, so yeah, that initial sort of shock or again, it may be even a form of overwhelm like I was just talking about that we feel when we are dealing with pain or difficulty. Again, I'm sure most of us went through that when the pandemic started of this feeling of like, you know, being dumbfounded and really not sure what to do. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I've never heard any specific advice for that, but the recognition that it does change, that we can, you know, we're not in that state that we were in when this all started. We're in a very different state now. Our, hopefully our hearts are more open. Hopefully we can, you know, do more with uh, what the world's presenting us at this point. Um, that's another verse from Master Shanti Deva's sixth chapter, where he says essentially that nothing whatsoever doesn't become easier through the f uh, force of familiarity. They will become more familiar with things. Things do become easier. Of course, that's the problem with anger is we haven't addressed it and we are very familiar with it. So it's very easy for it to arise. But if we become more familiar with patience and compassion and all these positive qualities that we're trying to generate on the path, they will be more inclined to arise and perhaps they will arise even sooner. So maybe the work is that when our life isn't so much in that 
shocking place where we just feel a bit of overwhelm and can't really deal with things that we just work on having all of that that we can draw from and maybe it'll be more at the forefront when we do have those situations and that will fall away much easier and we'll actually feel like oh this is good i get to roll up my sleeves and get to work now i don't feel that shock or that i think that's what you're talking about rowena did you want to share anything more in regard to this question or what i've said I think you're right about developing practices to overcome, you know, sudden things or, or very striking things. Um, I don't, I don't want to sound negative. It may just simply be that over time I've had to do that so often mm -hmm. that I need to set up a different, like you're talking preliminary basis when you talk about some of what you're doing. Maybe I'm not, rooted enough in my preliminary strengths mm -hmm. to, to, you know, like, because I can tend to get a little bit, oh, God, here comes this again, you know, <laughs> and, and I don't, I, you know, like, I have to really get a hold of myself every time that happens. And then I feel like I'm holding my breath. Right. And I can shift, you know, and it gets kind of crazy sometimes. So sure. And so I think, I think, again, you're speaking to a very common experience that we all have. And, and I do think that there is some truth to if we have a strength of practice coming into those situations, sometimes it's hard to have that, you know, because we're dealing with it quite frequently, like this year has been just an amazingly rich year for practice, but very challenging, because every time we turn around, there's something else that just shocks us or puts us in this state of paralysis or whatever, you know, but if we have the strength of practice, then I think we are much more inclined to go there rather than to that place of shock. Or if we do have the shock, we fall out of that much more easily and recognize uh, that it is time to roll up our sleeves and do the work. So I don't know if I have any other better advice than that maybe others in the virtual gompa here have something they could share from their own experience, but um, it may just be again something that 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 is that initial opening to things happening again the uh, this is why I like go back to venerable rabina's teachings where at the very at the very beginning of the pandemic where she was really saying that we have to be really careful around the fear that might arise all that stuff those very heavy emotions that can be there and recognize that that is just compounding our suffering even the shock the paralysis is not getting us where we want to be you know we want to be able to work with whatever is happening in our lives but we sometimes have to go through that. But if it becomes something that we get lost in, you know, that we just can't break out of, well, then that's where it becomes much more problematic. Um, but I think we all go through that to some degree. Yeah. Some of this is because I'm used to dealing with, like you say, I mean, you've been my teacher a long time, with these things as step by step as if they were my personal problems. Now there's this huge overlap between what's happening personally and what's happening societally and what's happening to my family and everybody else's i mean it's like and that maybe it's just that that's i'm on a state of overwhelm i mean this mm. it's hardly mm. the only time i've ever been there so i should but it's a little bit bigger maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know like what you're saying worldwide thing that you know yeah we've come down with so it's, it's amazing the level of group karma with this sure and this is where again to try to keep our this is the goal is to have our hearts that wide open so that we can embrace the suffering of the whole world but obviously you know this is a indication that we aren't there yet you know that it's very hard to be in that space you know and use it as a lesson don't use it as a way of beating ourselves up but to recognize that this is quite an achievement to be able to be you know open and holding the suffering of the world in our own hearts uh, and uh, being okay with it at some level. I mean, again, it doesn't mean we don't want it to end. It just means that we are okay in putting that into the path, putting that into our own spiritual development and doing what we can in the world to address it. Yeah, I mean, volunteer to help out with food distribution or whatever needs to happen during these challenging times if you can, if you feel comfortable doing that, or at least write the check or make the you know online donation or whatever for organizations that are uh, so involved in helping others. But, you know, uh, this is the challenge. This is what we have to face is the time. The world isn't always going to be the ideal place for us to 
practice in terms of our own comfort level and our own, you know, preliminary development. It's going to be whatever the karma causes it to be. And we're going to have to do the best we can within the sphere of that. So yeah, don't beat ourselves up. That's a big thing, you know, but recognize the work that's there to be done. Thank you, Rowena. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Good. Anyone? Dawn. Hi, this is Don. Hi, Don. Hi, Don. Good to see you. What hi, is, Christopher. <laughs> I'm wondering about uh, just the daily practice of um, what is the strongest practice to sort of neutralize attachment to the pleasurable things, especially like we're coming up on Thanksgiving. You know, I'm going to make this beautiful meal. We ha have this comfortable bed and electricity and water. And how do I, you know, um, make like, how do I reduce my attachment to those very amazing gifts in my life? Like, you know, I, I, cause I, when I feel the suffering of the world, I like really, it's almost an easier practice for me to like go in there and feel for everyone and do the equanimity and do, do practices uh, of, of the Tonglen. Now, I think it's a little more elusive in my mind about when pleasurable things are happening in, in my life, which are daily, um, how do I reduce that attachment? Like what practice is important to reducing my attachment to the pleasurable things? Right. You know? Mm -hmm. No, it's a very good point on. I think that this is sometimes a little bit harder for us for some reason. You know, when suffering is happening, there is almost this, again, seeds of empathy that we all have that we're open to. But when we fall into the experience of the more pleasurable things, it's not quite as easy to uh, engage in what I think would, again, my estimation, be the corresponding emotion, which is the compassion is there when we are witnessing suffering or experiencing suffering. It should be the loving kindness and the embracing of the welfare of others from that angle that should be there when we are experiencing those things that are pleasurable and enjoyable in our lives. So it's really kind of the other half of the Tonglen exercise, which is, you know, experience and it's interesting we have this holiday coming up that it's all about gratitude or it's supposed to be at least that's the title of the day but nonetheless you know do how many people actually use it as a day to recollect uh, the things they're grateful for there's another wonderful meditation at jack cornfield's uh, website on gratitude that's really a nice way uh, and one student even wrote to me asking for some recommendations on a meditation to do that day uh, to embrace the concept of gratitude and it's a really nice one again maybe I'll, I've got it on my computer. I'll give it to Mary. We can put it in the, the box there. And I'll we'll do that with the forgiveness meditation as well. But, but anyway, what, that's one of the starting points for when we do have something in our lives and you have the good fortune of having you know access to food and to good company and everything else that's going to be a part of that day to really feel an immense gratitude, a gratitude for all the people that contribute to that happening, but also to yourself for having created the good karma to be able to experience those things. And of course, we don't create that great, that good karma in isolation. And the karma of having things in our lives, of having uh, good food, uh, company, all of that, that's through the force of our having uh, done those things for other people, been generous with our own resources towards others, uh, been attentive to and caring for others in uh, various ways that they are then caring for us and being a part of our circle of friends and so on. So we didn't create these things independently. So we can be grateful for the role that others play in the temporal world of producing the various food that we eat and so on, but also karmically, that they were a part of the creation of that good karma that we are able to enjoy. And on the basis of that gratitude, then to extend a wish that others have that, you know, that as we're partaking of that food to do the best that we can to practice giving that away. And of course, if you can spend your day giving to others, I remember when I was living in San Francisco, I was quite involved with the um, AIDS Foundation and they would annually have a uh, Thanksgiving meal for people with AIDS and their friends and family. And it was the best thing to do with my Thanksgiving. I mean, I, I got to where I just enjoyed doing that so much that I didn't really care about not having the gathering at home and the family and friends and whatever, all this stuff, because it just felt like such an important way to give to others and to attend to others who were suffering. 
and who needed kind of a, a, a different experience because most of their life wasn't the way my life was going and so on. So, I mean, it's wonderful if you can do something like that. I don't know that all of us have the ability to that, and especially with the pandemic going on, it's very hard to imagine uh, many of these places, I think, will be quite limited in terms of what they do and all that. But so, you know, the, the reality is most of us will be sitting there having our own little small gathering with our food. Practice giving that to others, practice opening our hearts to wanting them to have that. Um, and not just, again, that mere experience of temporal pleasure, but the pleasure all the way up to Buddhahood, uh, that they have all the conditions that they need to meet with qualified teachers, to practice the Dharma, to be a benefit to others, to develop their own minds, to become a Buddha, and so on. All the various things, you know, we want for others. So I don't, I think that's the best way to work with it. I'm sure there are many other ways to work with it, but gratitude and loving kindness sound to me and like that thought of sending that out to others is really a powerful way to work with this. So um, does that sound like that, something that would be helpful? That does. That sounds okay. like that every time that I'm aware of a, mm -hmm. of a gift like that, I can uh, extend that to everyone else that maybe doesn't have that. Yeah. And even all those that do, you know, to just to, to be grateful and to rejoice in the fact that there are those that do have the good fortune to have a delicious meal that day, just like you, you know, they also created that through the force of their own karma and we can rejoice in that. So rejoicing can be another thing. So you can have gratitude, loving kindness, rejoicing. These are always, you know, really wonderful ways that we can work with good experiences in our own lives and in others' lives. Um, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Don. All right, good. Okay, anyone else? Any questions or comments in terms of uh, what we've talked about? Let me put it back on gallery view so I can... Yeah, Don. Oh yeah, Bobby, hi. Don. <laughs> Sorry, cat trap. <laughs> um, I wanted to respond to the, I, I think it's. I think it's a challenge to have a mind of gratitude and a mind of attachment at the same time. <laughs> I'm not sure that you do that so that, um, you know, I don't, I know that I can, I mean, I can, I'm aware of a shift when I go from attachment to gratitude that um, is beneficial. Let's just say that. And yet, <clears throat> The other thing I wanted to address was Rowena's um, dilemma. And I certainly have faced a lot in the last nine months. Um, here it comes again, here it is again, here they are again, whatever. And one of the things that's helped me a great deal with dealing with that kind of sort of downer thinking is to remember that even though it looks the same, everything's changed. I'm different, the situation is different on the surface. If I'm only looking at surface, surface might seem the same, but in fact, all the players have changed in the interval um, since I last confronted it. And for me, somehow that just helps me shift my mind mostly to um, um, what I say, one of confidence in myself um, that I can deal in an improved way with the situation. Because um, of course I keep improving, I never backtrack. So that <laughs> helps me um, approach it. Good. And holding a cat helps <laughs> too. No, these are both both good points. I appreciate you bringing those up, Bobby. I mean, again, you know, it is hard to move away from the attachment, but I mean, Venerable Robina often talks about this, how Rinpoche says that, you know, if we're going to have things in our life that bring us 
pleasure and we're going to have the mind of attachment rising, well, then we try to infuse as much as possible some positive thinking with that. It's not going all the way to where we don't have any attachment at all because most of us aren't capable of doing that yet. But we just try to do what we can to introduce some positive things within that, to have some bodhicitta, some loving kindness, some compassion, what have you, some opening our hearts to others. And that way we can change those experiences and not make them completely non-virtuous, you know, just shoveling food into our mouth or whatever. So, but then, yeah, I appreciate you bringing up too about that, how things change, even though it, it's, we might say here it comes again, you know, it's all coming back around again, but we are in a different place. And that's the wonder of this practice is that if we are actually dedicating ourselves day in and day out to doing the things that I'm going through to actually working with our minds, then we are in a different place in terms of our experience of, of that and our ability to respond to it more creatively, more, uh, may not mean that the outside looks any different, but the inside can look an awful lot different. <laughs> so, so thank you for bringing up both of those points. I think they're yeah, very, very good. Anyone else, anything before I just want to do a little bit more, maybe on this third type of patients, uh, at least introduce this, but okay. Again, if you do have further questions, feel free to you know write them down, send them in, whatever, and we'll make sure that they get addressed uh, in next week's class. But let me go on to this third type of patients, just so we have at least uh, talk about that a bit before we conclude today. This is called the patience of definitely thinking about the Dharma, which we could describe as it is on your chart there as well, the attitude, willing to constantly listen to, think about, and meditate on the Dharma. So. It is a form of patience. It's kind of an interesting one. It's not quite the patience that we were talking about earlier, though it can manifest sometimes in our own annoyance and our own frustration at working with the Dharma. You know, I sometimes use the analogy when I talk about the, the Dharma path as being like, you know, we, we are a, a sort of boat or our mind is a boat, if you will, or our being is a boat, and we are floating down a river that we've created. You know, we've created the current of that river and the direction it's moving in, which is our samsaric experience. Well, what we are trying to do in our Buddhist practice is, first of all, to go against the current, you know, to get the boat to move around. If you've ever been in a boat and tried to go against the current on a river, especially if it's a pretty rapid river, it's almost impossible, right? And I'm not trying to discourage people by using this. I'm just you know, giving people some understanding of the difficulty that we have entailed in this and why we could need a patience with regard to that is because we're first trying to get the boat to go in the opposite direction. But that's only part of the process. Then you have to get the whole river to flow in the opposite direction because we want to reverse the thinking in our minds and the habitual ways that we have of doing things and reacting to things. And we get, make that into something that is much more in line with truth, much more in line with an ability to be responsive and open to the uh, suffering of the world and what have you. You know, all the positive qualities we're trying to create are part of making that river go in the opposite direction. So we need a lot of patience. The Dharma is not an instant path. Those people coming to the Dharma, you know, thinking, oh, uh, in two weeks, I'll be a Buddha. You know, <laughs> well, maybe if you practice an awful lot in your prior lives, you're going to get enlightened more quickly. But for most of us, this is something we are probably going to have to dedicate many lifetimes towards. I'm not, again, trying to discourage you from having the thought that you're going to get enlightened in this life. That's a wonderful ambition. And if it's motivated by genuine compassion for others and your wish to benefit them, that's wonderful to hold that thought that you want to get there as quickly as possible. But for most of us, we just have to recognize that this is a long, arduous process of changing our minds. You know, our minds are malleable. And it's interesting that even in science, they've pointed to the fact that the brain is, you know, there's neuroplasticity. Things can change in the brain. We can rewire our brains, uh, get new synapses and new pathways that are influenced by what we think. So we have a support with this human life to be able to sustain this and grow this, but it doesn't mean it's easy. It just means we have to do the work. And this is why this patience is taught, is because this is the patience of persevering in our practice of the Dharma. It might sound more akin sometimes to the next perfection that we're going to look at, which is joyous effort or enthusiasm. But it's really, again, a, a subtler state where we're just being undisturbed in the face of whatever it is we have to deal with in our life. There's a wonderful quote from Lama Zopa that um, I've never seen it in writing, but it was at the teachings that I was fortunate enough to attend with him in 2004 at the tail end of the master's program. 
you know, we didn't have an opportunity throughout the master's program for much interaction with Rinpoche at all. He came one time, I think around 2001 or 2000 for just a short visit and did an audience with the master's program students. And it was really wonderful, but they wanted an opportunity for all of us to taste doing retreat with Rinpoche. So they did a four week uh, retreat uh, on uh, Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga and the whole practice of Guru Yoga and what have you. So, but as part of these teachings, Rinpoche said this wonderful phrase that uh, really stuck with me. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but essentially what he said is, we need to stop investing in the pleasure, the happiness that leads to suffering and be willing to be with the suffering that leads to happiness. And what he's meaning by that is two different things by suffering and happiness in those two statements. The first one is what we tend to do, which is that we are happily going about engaging in all the stuff that only brings suffering. You know, if we get, uh, we were talking about attachment just a short while ago, if we just fill our lives with all these pleasurable, delightful things, and we get to the end of our life and we haven't done anything that is a more you know, motivating force in a different direction, we will simply have created the causes for more suffering. We won't really have done anything meaningful with this life. So we have to abandon the happiness that leads to suffering because that happiness is, un is tainted. It's not going to get us anywhere. You know, the happiness of samsara, as we saw earlier, is actually a form of suffering, of dukkha. So stop investing in that because it's just a cause of more suffering. Whereas the other part of it, we need to endure and be patient with the suffering that actually leads to happiness. And here, it's the suffering we have to endure by turning our minds towards the Dharma, by gaining certainty with regard to the topics of the Dharma and deepening, deepening our own understanding of them so that we can then actually get real happiness, true happiness, not fleeting temporal happiness that only leads to more suffering, but the true happiness that awaits as we you know, develop our minds in that direction. And it's not to say that it's some goal out there that that's when we'll experience happiness. You can experience happiness right now. This is what Rinpoche often calls the happiness of Dharma. And I think we all know it to some degree. I mean, we wouldn't keep showing up at, in these you know, gatherings if we didn't have some conviction that this was a path that led to greater well-being for ourselves, and certainly then a conviction that it leads to greater well-being for others. We know that this leads to happiness, that our ability to endure through these things, to actually develop uh, patience and uh, good morality and generosity and all the things we're looking at in this course, that this will actually lead to a better you, a happier you at a deeper level that isn't contingent upon these external situations. So that's the preface for what I'm looking at in regard to this. And next week, what we'll do is continue this and go a little bit more into depth on what it is that we need to gain certitude towards. Uh, Rinpoche talks about this in a very brief way in his book, but then there is a more detailed list of uh, eight objects, eight things that are essentially everything the Buddha taught to some degree um, that we need to have some certitude towards and a patience with regard to our understanding of them, our increasing our awareness of them and incorporating them into our lives. So what I would encourage you to do, it's about five minutes to noon. I don't know if we need to take any more questions since we just did questions, but um, uh, if you can, over the next week or so, try to look at those suffering experiences that you have through the lens of at least one of these techniques that I went through today. We all are going to experience some form of, we will all experience some form of suffering over the next week, probably over the next hour. <laughs> you know, something will happen that will be a disappointment to us, that will be a, some pain or difficulty. And see if you can begin to channel it into whichever one you feel is appropriate for where you're at in your own practice. For some of you, it may simply be the reminder oh, this unpleasant feeling that I'm having right now, this is a creation of my own karma. I need to stop doing things that lead me into that and start doing things that are more positive and virtuous so that I don't experience suffering any longer. For some of you, it may mean that you need to diminish your arrogance, your pride and saying, wow, this is a reminder that, you know, I don't have it all made already. You know, I, I'm still a suffering being in samsara, just like everyone else, you know, don't get up on our high horse and what have you. For others, it may be the mind of renunciation. You know, go, this is evidence of the nature of existence, and I'm going to turn my mind towards liberation. I really want to be free of this kind of nonsense that is all involved in samsara. And for other, others, it might be that compassion, opening up to the suffering of others, wishing to take away their suffering and what have you. 
but just choose one that you want to work with and then also try to incorporate that into your meditation. As I said the, in Rowena's question, the ability for us to deal with things and some of us may face a shock or something really sh big shift or change in our world or in our own individual lives uh, over the next week. Uh, we need to be prepared to work with those. Um, and initially we might feel a bit you know, paralyzed, but we have to kind of get up again and do the work. And that means applying uh, our Dharma understanding and teachings to our situation. So again, I would encourage you over the next week to at least try something on and see how it works and gain some conviction that this is a something you can do. It's a very valuable way to work with the suffering that we have in our lives. Enough of me being on a soapbox on that, but I just thought I'd emphasize that these teachings aren't just, you know, nice little things that you can know and write down on a list and what have you. These are meant to be actually practiced. So that's the important side of it. All right, Mary. So if we could uh, get the prayers up there and I don't, yeah, I think we'll just do the prayers at this point. Um, bringing to mind, of course, all those beings that we are dedicating for, that we're holding in our hearts, because we're going to recite these wonderful verses from Shanti Deva's text. So we obviously we do have a prayer list uh, for TNL. We won't recite all those names today, but we can think about all the beings that we and others have put on that list who are dealing with obstacles, who have illness, who are dying, or who have died. And we can also think about all the other beings who uh, we're holding in our hearts. Obviously, we want to hold all beings in our hearts, but nonetheless, those that we do have a karma with that we feel very close to, it is important that we make prayers for their well-being. So holding those beings specifically in our hearts, as well as all beings, let's recite these wonderful prayers from Shanti Deva that make the best uh, dedication for what we have done here today. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. And that sentiment in that verse in particular, we can think about those beings who embody that already, our precious gurus who live their lives for the benefit of others who continue to abide in this world to relieve the suffering of all beings. And we make strong prayers for their good health and long lives so they can continue to guide us and others on our path to enlightenment. So let's recite the prayer for these three precious teachers uh, to have good health and long lives and extend that to all guides. The wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And then for Lama Zopa Rinpoche, you who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples. Please, please live long. And then finally for Osohita, who is Lama Yeshe's reincarnation. Venerable one, to you whose kindness exceeds that of all the conquerors for those wanderers in far off places, especially the West, Mindful of your loving concern for us in intentionally descending again into a family of a far distant land, we make this request. 
Olama, please, please live long. So again, I hope everyone has a very uh, peaceful and safe Thanksgiving. Uh, again, try to bring these minds of gratitude and loving kindness into your celebration and to really, again, acknowledge that uh, uh, what we have in our lives, we can be so grateful for all the beings that are involved in creating this and kind of extend that out to them with the wish that all beings have everything they need to sustain, to sustain themselves, sorry, both temporally and ultimately all the way to enlightenment. Okay, good. So have a good week and I'll see some of you during the week, but uh, hopefully see you all again next Sunday then. All right, be well. Thank you.